Welcome to uh, this day Friday, Earth Day, for Dutch Innovation Days. Uh, my name is Mitch Altman, and we'll be in conversation with uh, Sarah Durst. This is your name? Durston. We've, Durston, sorry. Okay. Uh, we've just met. And um, yeah, Sarah, according to the little intro on the website, uh, has been awarded through NWO three pretty prestigious grants uh, through beginning, middle, and senior versions of research. Um, and your area is brain and consciousness as far as, is yeah. that right? Well, um, close. My, my, the grants I got, uh, the last one of those was 2011. And they were all for um, studying the brain and brain development in developmental disorders, and in particular, ADHD. And um, so I built this whole program of research with these grants. And then uh, at the end of the last of them, so well, not quite, I guess that was a, well, sort of 2013, 14, 15, began to realize that we needed another way of thinking about it. And that's when I started getting interested in consciousness. So I've sort of been shifting my interest over the last 10 years, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So shifting to consciousness in order to get a better handle on disorders such as ADHD? Um, yes, I've, I've always been interested in consciousness for its own right, um, but the line of research that uh, I'd built with the lab was very biological, so we were basically looking for where in the brain, what in the brain is it that is causing ADHD or autism or whatever. Um, developmental disorder uh, we happen to be looking at and um, one of the things we were doing in that research is trying to uh, find better ways of explaining the variation you see in the phenotypes so in the symptoms people with ADHD have that were more grounded in biology than the ways we had and we managed to build these uh, better models but it turns out they didn't actually explain the phenotype any better than the less biological models and that's what made me think well maybe you know we need to take other aspects into account here um, and that's when I started to think well you know but symptoms don't happen to people with ADHD but the child with ADHD doesn't say oh I have hyperactive behavior they say you know I have a hard time sitting still and I wobble in my seat it becomes part of uh, their identity it happens in their consciousness so that basically gave me an excuse to start thinking about consciousness again which is why I got into psychology in the first place um, and started reading about it and watching TED Talks and stuff like that, as you do. And uh, began to think that maybe, you know, thinking about um, psychiatry and psychological vulnerability in more than just a biological manner might inform us more than the research I'd been doing. And has it? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I don't, yeah, well, yes, I, th I think it's, uh, it's helping. I mean, um, uh, I mean, you know, it's early days. And I think one of the things that um, I stumbled across when I started investigating consciousness and thinking about consciousness and listening to people who actually studied consciousness, talking about consciousness, um, was that a lot of the techniques, because, well, well, let me just back up a moment. When I started doing psychology, when I went to university and read psychology, um, I went to do psychology because I was interested in consciousness, and then it turned out that psychology really wasn't about that back in the day. Um, so I became interested in other things like the brain and, and went in another direction. Um, however, since then, there's a whole field of consciousness research that's arisen, basically because uh, one of the uh, discoverers of DNA, Francis Crick, said, hey, there's this thing out here called consciousness and we really don't have an inkling of the science of it and instead of ignoring it, maybe we should actually study it. So him, he and several others actually kicked off the field in the early 1990s, which was also the decade of the brain. And it turns out the way that uh, many consciousness researchers have been studying consciousness is but the same way, basically, we've been studying psychiatry, where in the brain is it? How can we find it? Um, and when I started you know, going to conferences on consciousness and things in 2015, it turned out that one huge difference with the field I was in of psychiatry was that they were much further along in saying, well, actually, we can't find it. You know, maybe we're looking for consciousness in the brain, we can't find it, we're looking for what they call the neural correlates, so which, uh, which areas are active when you're conscious, um, which is pretty much how we were studying psychiatry. 
Um, but was it, what was really nice about that field is that there was not just neuroscientists populating it, but also philosophers and people who were thinking about it from a different point of view. And, um, you know, the, 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 they were talking about other possibilities than just reductionist materialism for looking in the brain. So instead of thinking, you know, well, consciousness has to be somewhere in the brain, we just need better ways of looking for it to find it, they were actually thinking, well, maybe we're asking these questions wrong, maybe we need to think it, about it in a different way. So that got me um, set off on that sort of a uh, path. and. From there, um, I well, started lots of different projects, all of them involving thinking and talking and not so much actual empirical study, uh, because when you start thinking about, well, maybe this isn't the right way to look for consciousness in the brain, then what is the right way? It's, you sort of run into a scientific wall that I still haven't broken through. Um, but it did set me, get me talking to people, and I started to realize that actually this sort of shift, and maybe we're thinking about this long way of reductionist materialism, is something that's not unique to consciousness studies, it's not unique to um, psychiatry, to neuroscience, it's something that seems to be happening in multiple fields. Um, so then what happened was I was uh, talk, having lots of interesting conversations with an acquaintance of mine as a psychotherapist who was also very interested in this. And we were reading books and then, you know, calling each other up and saying, have you seen this book? This is really interesting. This person from a completely different field has interesting things to say about this. Um, and then we got the idea, well, maybe we want, need to go talk to these people and just hear what they have to say. So we started, uh, you know, going around and talking to various scientists from various fields and uh, trying to get their perspective on uh, not just consciousness, but also, you know, how does science actually work and got the sense that things are changing in terms of how science actually works and where is this going? So, and, uh, you know, we're going around doing this and um, thought it might be a good idea to record these conversations in case, you know, maybe thought maybe at some point we can do something interesting with them. And after about the sixth of these conversations, I thought, well, you know, this is getting ridiculous. We're going around the world talking to people in all sorts of different areas that are very different from each other, that don't speak the same lingo, and, but they're all saying the same thing about the way science is changing. Um, so at that point, we thought, well, you know, we'd better do something with this and turn it into a book, and I was on sabbatical at the time. So I had about six months left on my sabbatical, so I dropped everything else I was doing, and. Uh, started turning it into a book, which is the book that came out in 2017 called The Universe, Life and Everything, which... Um, <laughs> the Universe, Life and Everything. Yeah, so the answer was a little bit more complicated than 42, but... 42, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which exactly. is the perfect answer, but totally inexplicable, like exactly. perhaps consciousness. Yeah. So did you come up with a way of thinking about and asking about what consciousness is rather than this reductionist version? Well, there's um, various alternatives out there, and one view um, that's been uh, championed uh, in particular by uh, well, several philosophers of mine, but one in particular is David Chalmers' is panpsychism, which is um, the idea that consciousness is everywhere. It's a fundamental uh, part of the universe, and um, so it's, and it has very, there's various flavors of panpsychism, but the most extreme is uh, it's everywhere and everything has consciousness, even elementary particles, and this table has consciousness. It may be different from your consciousness or mine, but it still has consciousness. Um, and perhaps the, um, I don't know if I want to say the most extreme, but perhaps the, the version that's the most uh, the, the alternative metaphysics, if you like, that's the most far away from materialism is idealism, which is the idea that um, all of reality, um, as we experience it, falls out of consciousness, which is the op um, opposite, of course, of materialism, where we think that everything around us, including our consciousness, somehow arises out of matter. So there's something that my brain is doing and all the molecules interacting in my brain, which are made up out of... Uh, atoms which are made up out of elementary particles somehow causes me to be conscious. Um, and the idealism is the reverse of that. So somehow consciousness does something that causes us to experience a material reality with concrete objects in it. So yeah, hard things, or at least perceive it as perceive hard. Perceive it as hard things, exactly. Yeah. yeah and, well, one of the reasons I got into, as an uh, electronics geek, as a little kid, what got me into physics and quantum mechanics is yeah. 
<coughs> thinking about consciousness, and there are many interpretations of what does quantum mean, if it means anything. And there are people who pretty much <coughs> say what you just said, that uh, consciousness is everywhere, and what we perceive is sort of the, the fields of consciousness sort of intersecting with us and our physicality and the interplay with that and energy yeah. <coughs> somehow arises as what we think of as consciousness, but none of us know what consciousness is, and yet we believe we have it. We experience it. Yeah. We experience exactly. it. Exactly, and that's... Um, and quantum physics is indeed one of the things that in the end made me say, well, you know, maybe we do need to write this book because quantum physics, of course, is weird because um, the way you set up experiments and the way you observe the system is what decides what you, uh, in some cases, what you, what you um, observe in the experiment, which m brings in the observer and therefore consciousness into reality um, at very small physical skills into very much into play. Um, and as you said, one of the people we spoke to for the book was Henry Stapp, who's a quantum physicist who's taken this all the way to the, to the extreme and said, you know, this means that the observer is what's key here, uh, consciousness is what's key here. Um, and I lost my trail of thought. Where, where was I going with this? <laughs> Not sure, it was just a comment. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, quantum physics is indeed one of the things that got me into it. And one of the things that I've been doing um, since the book, I mean, I think one, one of the things that really made me realize is how much we, as conscious observers, are important in the way we experience the world. I mean, and that's got me realizing that, you know, the only datum we actually have of what's out there is what we experience in our consciousness. I mean, thinking about seeing things, for instance, colors. I mean, we see a certain range of colors, which is, uh, you know, the colors in the rainbow. But insects, for instance, see into the ultraviolet range. And to them, plants look very different than they do to us. So if I see a red flower, is that for red actually a property of that flower? Is that property of me and the way I perceive it? So it gets you thinking about... Um, you know, the, uh, the way you take yourself out into the world and the way we as, as, as people, as communities, take ourselves out into the world. And of course, I'm a psychologist, and the, the, uh, one of the areas where that's evident, it should be completely evident, is when we're dealing with humans and uh, human sciences. You know, the way we think about and understand our human world is very much determined by, uh, by us. Um, and of course I come from psychiatry and spent years looking for psychiatry in the brain as if it was a property of the individual and the individual's biology. But it's also about the way we as uh, societies deal with people who, for whatever reason, don't uh, conform to what we expect people to be able to do. So for children with ADHD, um, it's a well-established fact is that the youngest kids in a class are more often diagnosed with ADHD and get ADHD meds than their slightly older classmates. You know, within one year, it's not a huge age difference between the children, but it's enough that they act that much younger that the chances of them ending up with an ADHD diagnosis is greater, which is very much an artifact of the way we've designed our school systems. Right. <clears throat> Everyone has to conform to the school system. Well, it's not just school systems. It's the way we understand, you know, our society. And, of course, there's implicit no norms in that that we are not always aware of. And it's okay to have norms, but it would be good to be aware that we have them and, uh, you know, that that also has consequences. And another thing about... Um, the way we think about psychiatry is that we, if somebody does, um, you know, have problems because they run into uh, issues in, in their daily life, we tend to think of that very much as a problem of the individual. But of course, it's always an individual in the context of their life and interacting with their family, with the workplace, with the school if they're in, in classes still. So it's, it's, um, there's different ways of looking at that. And I think we do that perhaps better in clinical practice than we do uh, in the science of it. Right, or in school systems. Or in school <laughs> systems, yeah. 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 My mom was a, a learning disabilities teacher. So, she was, yeah. And she was um, uh, lucky enough to be in a school system that provided for that. Yeah. In the country I came from, that's not so normal. And these kids... Um, had to deal with all sorts of, you know, kids know what the norms are, even if they can't articulate it. Yes. And they pick out people, other kids who don't fit those norms, and uh, that can be quite traumatic. 
Of and, course. Um, yeah, so these kids have very little sense of accomplishment or confidence in their lives, and it's because of how they fit or don't into society. And yeah. So, um, and for some people, these meds can be really like um, a savior, but for other ones, there's so much diagnosis of ADHD, at least in the, the States, that people are becoming drug addicts as little kids, which isn't necessarily a good thing. Yeah, and I mean, one thing, another project that we've started doing um, since, uh, since my sabbatical is um, about the way we talk about and understand what we're doing with, by giving these diagnoses to kids. So it's, uh, you know, uh, um, these DSM classifications that we use in the case of uh, developmental disorders, we give them to children while they're still young, while they're still developing, while they're still developing their identity. And quite often, you know, it becomes part of the story they tell about who they are for themselves too. Um, so one of the projects we have going on in Utrecht at the moment is looking at the intended and the unintended uh, consequences of labels, as we've uh, called them. Um, dependent of the context they're used in, dependent of who's using them, and dependent of the goal with which they're used. And one of the things, uh, it's, a, it's a great project because it's very multidisciplinary and we're working with all sorts of people, including some philosophers. And one of the things to come out of that is that one of the philosophers did this long in-depth analysis. And it's, it's, I mean, he was going to write a paper about it, but it's turning into a book because it was uh, so, <laughs> it came across so much information. Um, thinking about, you know, the, the way we use these labels, and of course they were developed f for one purpose, which was to help people and have sort of, a, sort of a unitary language that we could use to talk about the problems people have. Um, but they've been applied in many more ways. We've taken them on in society. So we talk about these labels, you know. Um, people say things like, oh, I'm so ADHD today. It's become an adjective that we t use to talk about how we're feeling that day. Or, um, you know, well, uh, Bob can't help his behavior. It's just what he's like. He has ADHD. It's because of his ADHD. And then ADHD, which was actually a label for the behavior, suddenly become the cause of the behavior, which, of course, is circular. Uh, when you think about it, and we use these labels also, you know, for financing the care we give to people. So you need a diagnosis to be able to get the, the health insurance company in the Netherlands to pay for the treatment you're getting. So it's, it's taken on this whole life of its, its own that's much broader than it perhaps uh, was intended for and perhaps should be. And, you know, it's, it's, some of these uses are fine, but I think we need to be aware that that's what we're doing. Indeed, yeah. because they can be used as judgments as well. Exactly, and the stigma that comes with that, of course. And but as you say, I mean, um, one of the proponents of labels, whom I've been working, says, but, but you know, the stigma doesn't come only out of the label. It also comes because, as you just said, these kids don't meet the norm, and other kids pick up on that. So the stigma attached, even if they don't get a label, it's it's their behaviour that's different, which is. Uh, different from the norm, that also leads to stigma. So there's a there's a point there too. Yeah, right. Yeah. So well, there's a lot of directions we can go here. We don't have a lot of time, but you were mentioning no. before about this um, art project, art psychiatry psychology. Project. Yes. So that's um, a project that's come out of the the labels collaboration that I was just talking about. Um, and one of the projects in that, uh, in Dutch, we've called Kletsbaar, which means it's about talking about psychological vulnerability. So Kletsbaar is vulnerable, Klets is Klets and talk in Dutch. Chat, really. Um, and uh, one of the things we wanted to do with that uh, is not only we're studying how people talk about psychological vulnerability and how the way we talk about it shapes how we understand it, um, relating us to the things we just talked about. And one of the things we wanted to do was to have people think about, well, you know, the way we perceive reality is, could be, and probably is, different for each of us. And the way we perceive reality isn't only dependent um, on the reality out there, but there's, there's ways you can play with that. Um, so one of the, what we originally envisaged doing for this, and it was a project that we were going to go to Lowlands with in, uh, in 2020, but then Lowlands got cancelled, so we've had lots of time to think about it and for it to develop in the, in the meantime. 
Um, one of the things we wanted to do was have um, a, a, a so-called snoozelkamer, is what it's called in Dutch. It's a, a room they, that they use sometimes in psychiatry too, which is basically we're a bit sensory deprived, so there's not too much stimulus, so a stimulation for people who are feeling a bit, you know, hyper can sort of calm down a little bit. So we were thinking about playing with that and seeing if we could sort of develop one of those and take it to Lowlands. And then um, I, I was watching the Jeugd Journal, so the children's news of my kids, um, sometime leading up to the next Lowlands we were going to be at, which was 2021. And there was um, a project on the, on the news, on the Jeugd Journal, um, by artist Florentijn Hofman, who designed this huge, big, inflatable green cocoon, which was sort of 26 meters long and several meters high, and it was in a church in Schiedam. And I was looking at it and thought, wow, that is the ultimate snoezelkamer. This is exactly what I need. So um, we went to see it in Schiedam, and it was indeed wonderful and weird because it's this big green space and it has no horizon and of course the sounds are different and everything. So I contacted Florentijn Hofmann and uh, told him what we were doing and he was very enthusiastic about the idea. I said, well, yes, no, I'd love to help you think about this and uh, see if we can design something. So he came up with this idea of a big um, inflatable cross, which is basically um, four cocoon-like shapes attached with different colours. So each arm of this cross has a different sensory experience. So you go into it, so you uh, go in either through the green or the blue arm, which feels, to me anyway, much calmer than going into the red arm, which can be quite intense. And there's, because of the shape of it, the sound sort of echoes around, and there's places where the sound is much louder than others. And again, there's no horizon, and you're inflating it. It sort of bounces around on the draft. So it's, it's this weird... Uh, sensory experience to get to think about, hey, how do I actually perceive the world? And of course, we had it on the Domplein not so long ago, for instance, in, in Utrecht. And you're standing there in the Domplein, there's lots of people. You go into this space, and suddenly you're in a, in a very different sort of a world. But it's going to be here tomorrow at the uh, exposition, for, in part of the Dutch Innovation Day, so anybody who's interested can go see it there. Where will it be? It's um, in the, gosh, I don't, know, don't remember what the space is called. It's what used to be the old Enschede Hospital, apparently. Ah, uh, yeah, Connect You. Connect You, okay. Connect You, that's where it will be. Wow. <laughs> and so this is really more of an art piece. It's not guided. It, you just go in there and experience what you yes. experience. Yes. The, this part is a, an art piece and is, is about the experience. So it's just to give people a sense of playing with their perceptions. Um, the other part of the project is talking, actually um, a research thing, talking about uh, uh, psychological vulner vulnerability. And there's a two-minute film fragment that people can scan a QR code with a phone and you get to see a two-minute film fragment and, and then you get asked some questions about the person in the fragment it's, uh, of a young woman talking about her own psychological vulnerabilities. Um, and just to give you a sense of, you know, how, how the way your um, ideas about psychological problems are feeding into the way you think about it. At the end of answering those questions, you actually get her answers to those questions as well, so it gives you a sense of that. Yeah, and on the way over here, I was talking to um, people, the people who are involved in the EEG KISS project, which is also at the Dutch Innovation Days, and talking about, you know, what we really need to do. One of the things that I found with this colour cross is that uh, the experience people have varies a lot, and people coming out of it, some are like, wow, that was the most amazing experience I've ever had, and oh, I couldn't bear to be in the red arm, it was much too intense, and other people come out and say, no, nah, it didn't really bother me at all. So uh -huh. it's, it's very different, so one of the things we are thinking about doing now is seeing if we can add in something where we actually do something a bit more research-oriented with the colour cost itself too, but we haven't done that yet, so for, for now it's just about the experience. Right, so for research you could ask people in some kind of systematized way what they experienced? For example, we would just get a, you know, a range of experience. Another thing we could do, I mean we haven't worked this out yet, uh, but one thing we've been doing for another project involved in labels is to do sort of in-depth interviews with people and sort of really, you know, and then you wouldn't do it with everybody, of course, because it's much too much work for that, but you'd uh, have a really have a, you know, ask a few people if they really want to explore their uh, experience with you, so that might be another way to go, more of a qualitative direction. Yeah, well, this reminds me of a, a project that I did with a friend, uh, just briefly. I, I've made these glasses that blink uh, LEDs in front of your eyes at brainwave frequencies, 
oh, heard yeah. about things like these. So light and sound machines, they've been around since the 70s. And, and when you do that, your brain doesn't really know how to perceive the blinking lights, so you hallucinate all sorts of beautiful colors and patterns. Yeah. So, um, and that brings people out of the day-to-day -day as well in a different way than the, the big cocoons with different colors. But um, we had people uh, draw what they experienced. Cool. And, and that was really, yeah. really cool. And then people compared and talked about that. And um, questions. Oh, shall we see? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Comments? No. I'd really like this for a bit. Yeah. Well, there's, when, I, when I looked up your name earlier today, as I, I mentioned before, I found uh, your name listed as one of many people in this one, and I can't remember the name of the organization, the website, that seems to be focused on um, reality, not necessarily being the physical world that we perceive. Yeah, that's the Essentia Foundation, and indeed that's a foundation um, whose aim it is to promote idealism, so the idea that um, reality falls out of consciousness as opposed to the reverse, is a serious metaphysical framework for science too, and that you can, you know, that's not something to be dismissed, but it's actually a metaphysical framework that we could compare to materialism and, and you know, try and figure out which one is actually going on. Yeah, right. and I'm, I'm on the scientific advisory board of that foundation, which is why you found my name. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and this is, um, you know, again, realms of quantum. Uh, some people interpret things in this yeah, way. So. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yes, as I said, I do think science is changing and this is becoming a much more accepted alternative. I mean, uh, before the 1990s, there wasn't even a field of consciousness studies, and now people are thinking about idealism as a, a, a serious metaphysics for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I was. Before I quit my PhD program, uh, I got a third, of the, a third of the way into it, and um, uh, my project was to explore consciousness. And what mm. I was thinking in terms of sort of the quantum view of things is, well, if consciousness really is everywhere in some form or another, and we perceive it in certain ways, what if I made uh, an outrageously giant uh, neural network out of a lot of teeny little computer chips? and had some things that were somehow similar to the way our brains work with some random elements thro thrown in. Would it's, and with sensors to determine what's going on in the outside world and then have things that show us what's going on, would we perceive that as somehow conscious? Would we perceive it or would it perceive itself? Well, both, but how can <laughs> we know what it's perceiving? Yeah. We can only know what we're perceiving, so... and. Um, I didn't do that project, but... Um, cool. Would yeah. have been a cool project to do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, this is, I think, one of the um, questions that people are working on a lot because, of course, we are building these bigger and better uh, computers all the time, including the quantum computers are coming up. Are these computers going to have consciousness? And uh, do comp computers perhaps already have consciousness and are we just not aware of that? And if so, what are the, uh, the uh, ethical ramifications that fall out of that? If my computer is conscious, am I even allowed to turn it off? Yeah. Right, that, yeah. that's exactly what I was thinking too. If this thing did have consciousness, what about the reset button? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I think we're going to Okay. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.